Howdy y'all. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about archival cradles. This is a clamshell jacket or cradle and it's uh, made out of fiberglass and plaster and we use these to protect fossils for long-term storage. This is a dolphin skull. I'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. Um, sometimes fossils are relatively fragile and we cannot store them on a flat surface uh, without them crumbling or collapsing under their own weight. So they need a little bit of uh, a little bit of help. This is different from a field jacket, uh, which is made out of plaster and burlap, uh, which is a type of cloth. Um, fiberglass. We use the same kind of fiberglass that you buy uh, from, <clears throat> or that you'd use for like a, a boat hull. Only that's cemented together using resin. Um, in this case, we use. Uh, high quality plaster. So you get the fossil, and you get it prepared out of the rock it uh, came in, um, and in the low country our fossils are not very mineralized if they're excavated directly out of the ground, and they're really prone to um, fracturing and collapsing if they are removed from the rock. So they do need this uh, uh, protective jacket to keep them stable. Uh, we've got two sides to it. We hold them together with these bolts. So it's literally just quarter inch bolts from the hardware store with a couple washers and a wing nut. Um, let's take these off. Talk about the labels here in a minute. We usually do for a, anything bigger than about a football if there's a really, really tiny skull, we'll, we'll do two bolts, but most often we use a minimum of three. For really big specimens, we might use a fourth one. Um, but if we open this up, there's a beautiful dolphin skull in here. And it's missing about six inches or so of the snout, but we've got the blowhole here, uh, jaw muscle attachments, and the uh, skull has been caved in a little bit. This specimen was prepared by myself and former uh, grad student Jordy Taylor. Um, uh, Jordy Wolf now. Um, this is from, I think, well, the Ladson Somerville area anyway, and it's a 23 million year old dolphin skull. I'll talk more about that in a moment, and we'll flip it over and we'll get a good look at the teeth. So the way we, we would do this, once it's exposed, um, and we're pretty sure there's not any more rock we want to remove. We will cover it in tinfoil, uh, maybe a little bit of padding, um, but we want to make sure we have an impermeable barrier because plaster is very difficult to remove directly from a fossil. So uh, sometimes we use tinfoil, usually a couple layers, or we'll use saran wrap, sometimes both. Um, cover the fossil, and then you literally mix this high quality plaster called hydrocal uh, which m I think is the same kind of plaster used to make casts of your teeth at the uh, dentist or orthodontist office. Um, we mix that up with water, make it kind of runny, and you literally just cut strips of fiberglass, fiberglass sheeting, you dip it into the plaster, and then you lay it on top. Um, fiberglass is really pokey, so we have a lot of different steps we use to re uh, reduce the likelihood of getting stabbed by fiberglass splinters, which end up mostly in between your fingers or in your, you know, inside of your elbow, and they're extremely irritating if you work with fossils like this on a regular basis and need to open it up. Um, so we trim off the excess plaster and uh, fiberglass pokey bits with this little uh, cheese grater-like device, um, and we take it out back and we use a blowtorch and burn off all of the exposed fiberglass. And we do, and then we cover it with another bit of plaster, then we burn it a second time, and if necessary, we'll do a third coating of plaster on the outside. Um, then, plaster on itself is relatively hard, so we line this with foam to make sure that uh, it's soft enough um, that the skull or fo whatever fossil it is won't break. So let's go ahead and flip this over. For a big specimen, you always want to put the bolts back in, but it's not necessary for a, a fossil this small. Um, just, you know, don't drop it and be careful. So flip it over. 
Uh, we have copious labeling practices here at uh, the Mace Brand Museum of Natural History. I have been, and I'm not going to name names, but I've been to many different museums where they only had a single specimen number label on a jacket. And sometimes that side of the jacket is not on the shelf you can see. Sometimes it's up high. They're, they're usually, usually often kept on top of cabinets. Um, so I wanted to make sure when I made these here that the labels would be uh, informative and accessible from all angles. So we can see it says CCNHM 1078. That is the uh, catalog number of the specimen. But we also have skull, Wipatia day, uh, and ventral side. So we know what side is what. We flip it over and we see that it also says the specimen number in here. Because often uh, skulls that are jacketed will have the number on one side and visiting researchers will see this and try and identify it. And they might not, uh, may not have written it down and from their photographs might not know what it is. So we put these numbers here so that there's no ambiguity whatsoever uh, over what the specimen is. Um, now, I did say this is a Wipatiid dolphin skull. Wipatiids are the quote-unquote spear-toothed dolphins, um, first discovered by my PhD advisor, Ewan Fordyce, in the Oligocene of New Zealand. This is a very similar specimen to Wipatia matafenua. Uh, it's got these very similar-looking cheek teeth here. Um, it's about the same age, actually, but from uh, rocks of the same age in South Carolina. So Wipatiid dolphins lived both in the South Pacific and the Northwest Atlantic. Um, two environments on Earth that couldn't be further apart. So thanks for tuning in. Um, please leave a comment uh, if you have any questions about plaster jackets, fossil dolphins, etc.